Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you back with us again today. You know, in the previous screencast in this unit, we focused mainly on the economic impacts of industrialization. But in today's session, we want to look to some of the social changes brought about by industrialization. So today, it is the societal impacts of industrialization. Let's go to those essential questions. Uh, we want to focus on two social groups today and see the effects that industrialization had on them. We'll start with the middle class and we want to examine how industrialization and, and economic growth impacted the lives of the middle class. Then in general we'd kind of like to get a little bit of a snapshot of what life is like for middle class individuals during this time. Then we move on to the lives of the working class and we'll see what uh, what their working conditions are like, factory conditions and factory labor and see why that is so dangerous and what some of the dangers are that they might face. Additionally, we'll see what the living conditions for many working class individuals were like and why they ended up living this way. Finally, we'll see how the advent of labor unions helped to bring about change and improve the lives and working conditions of folks in the working class. So those are the essential questions. That's what we want to cover today. Thus, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And so let's begin with the, with the middle class. Industrialization really expanded the size and the wealth of this social group. Before the Industrial Revolution, the bourgeoisie, remember that's the French word for middle class, was made up really only of a very small exclusive number of people, bankers, lawyers, doctors, merchants, folks like that. But with industrialization comes uh, you know, the expansion of wealth, the growth of opportunity, and now we see that the middle class includes people like owners of factories, owners of mines, owners of railroads, people who were willing to take the risk, invest in these businesses, and have now been successful. But the middle class also includes a lot of their professional staff, people like clerks, accountants, office managers, and even teachers. Uh, fueled by capitalism, industrialization and the growing economy has now provided greater opportunities for economic upward mobility. There is an expansion of wealth, there's more money and more jobs available to more people, and so with more people making more money, they're able to move up the economic ladder into the middle class. And to members of the middle class, a lot of them felt like education was really the key to their success, that you could go to school, get an education, an education that would prepare you for a better job, a better job that would make more money, and a better job that makes more money allows you to live a much more comfortable lifestyle. In a typical middle class family, the man was the breadwinner. The man would work outside the home. This is the guy who gets up in the morning and kisses his wife and kids goodbye and heads off to the office. Uh, in the meantime, mom stays at home and takes care of the family. Women handle the household chores, the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry, taking care of the kids, that kind of thing. But if a family was wealthy enough, they could hire servants to do that stuff. Uh, they could afford to hire a maid to do the cleaning, a washerwoman to do the laundry, a, a cook to take care of the meals. Uh, you could even hire a nanny to help take care of your kids if you needed to. Uh, and so uh, women who were from very well-off middle-class families had a lot more leisure time than typical women did. Uh, and when it comes to the kids, the boys would go to school. Boys were expected to go to school and get an education, and in most cases would be expected to take on his father's job one day, especially if dad owned a factory or owned a mine you would be expected to step into your dad's role and take over that company when he was ready to retire. Now, as far as girls are concerned, girls would stay home. But this didn't mean that they didn't get an education. You could hire a private tutor uh, to educate your daughter. She was expected to be educated. She just didn't get to go to school with the boys. But girls also stayed home and learned how to tend to the household because one day they'd get married and probably become a housewife themselves. And so what we see is that industrialization in general is pretty good to the middle class. The growth of wealth, the growth of industrialization, the expansion of the economy has created a lot of opportunity, uh, and the middle class are taking full advantage of the opportunities that are afforded to them. But despite the wealth and success of the middle and upper classes, the benefits of industrialization are not felt by everyone. The working class is a new social class that emerges out of industrialization. The working class are those people who are employed as workers in the factories, in the mines, and in other industries. And at the beginning of industrialization, a lot of these people are displaced farmers, moving off of the rural areas, moving off of the farmland, and moving into the new urban areas to find jobs in the factories. And these guys are not experiencing the same benefits of industrialization that the middle class and the upper class does. 
Um, the problems that we see stem largely from the labor itself. I mean, unsafe working conditions are a danger faced by a lot of people in the working class. But it wasn't always that way. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, working conditions in factories weren't all that bad. You could go and get a job at the local textile mill. You could work a decent amount of hours and make a decent wage, and everybody would be happy. But as we see increased industrial competition, this is where things start to get a little bit more dangerous. Remember, it's a capitalist system, and the goal is profit. And when you have multiple companies competing for market share and competing for profit, uh, what you see is that the owners and the managers begin pushing their workers a lot harder. Uh, in order to make more profits, the managers often assign their workers more machines to operate, insist that they work faster, insist that they work longer hours. Because remember, the owner of the business is trying to keep costs low so that they can increase their profits, because that's the name of the game. We're pursuing the profit motive here. That doesn't necessarily make for safer better conditions for the people who are working and then eventually when we start to see the advent of division of labor workers are now doing the same monotonous task over and over and over again and you've got this combination of of boring work heavy noisy repetitive machinery that could make any kind of interruption very very dangerous if you're working along the the assembly line you could very easily lose focus and you know lose an arm or a leg in a machine I mean if you look at the picture there on the left hand side of the screen the bigger one you can see this factory room that is just packed to the gills with these machines all these open exposed moving parts only a very narrow island between them imagine you've been working a 10-hour shift and you're tired and you're walking down that aisle between the machines and you lose your balance only slightly your sleeve gets caught in one of those moving parts I mean, you can figure how badly someone could get hurt. Thousands of workers lose fingers and limbs and even their lives to factory machinery. And this is not to mention the number of hours that you'd even work. I mean, I sort of mentioned it a second ago there, but generally workers would work shifts from 12 to 16 hours a day. And a lot of these factories are unventilated rooms, you know. I mean, they're basically big buildings with no windows and no ventilation. Uh, this can create a bad environment for your respiratory health. I mean, if you're working in a textile mill, you're breathing in all of the lint from the textiles. If you're working in a mine, obviously, you're breathing in the dust from the coal. And, you know... It's not that the factory owners are going, ooh, how many workers can I hurt or maim or make sick today? Because that's not efficient. That's not good for business. But the thing of it is, it costs money to make those machines safer. It costs money to add ventilation to your factory. It costs money to close off uh, the, the moving parts of the machinery. Or if you look at that picture again to the left, it's more efficient to cram more of those machines into one building than it is to spread out fewer of them. And so it's, you know, it's not about I'm an evil business owner who wants to hurt people, but I'm seeking the profit motive over safety. And so with working back to the unventilated rooms there, I mean, diseases, respiratory illnesses like pneumonia and tuberculosis were really common working in these places. And they could spread very quickly throughout the factories, killing scores of workers. So factory work can be a very, very dangerous livelihood for these people in the working class. And speaking of wages, uh, we know that owners are trying to make as much money as possible. They're trying to keep their costs low. And so that owners could make more profits, the factory workers would get paid uh, as little as owners could get people to work for. Again, it's not about I'm trying to pay people to the point where they'll starve to death, but what factory owners will do is they figure out what's the lowest amount that they can get people to work for, and that's what they'll pay. And uh, so factory wages were, were so low that a lot of times what you see is that entire families end up having to work. Whereas mom could stay home in the middle class family, it's not the same in the working class family. And when women did work, uh, women in the working class were typically paid roughly half the salary of uh, what a man would get paid. And part of that was to try to encourage women to stay home and not work. But in the, middle, in, in the working class families, they couldn't really afford that. You know, We talk about wages being so low that the whole family had to work, dad, mom, even the kids. Yes, that's right. The children. Uh, children could start working as young as 6 to 10 years old, and they'd be working a 12-hour shift like an adult might work, uh, maybe getting only a short break to eat a small meal for 15 or 20 minutes about halfway through. And consider this, if those kids are working, what are they not doing? They're not going to school. And remember what we talked about with the middle class, they saw the key to their success as education. Well, if these kids aren't going to school and aren't getting an education, they're not going to be able to get a better job. 
And so they're going to end up in a low-paying job, which means they will remain uh, in this cycle of poverty. I'm too poor. My family's too poor, so I couldn't go to school. I had to work. Because I had to work, I couldn't go to school, so I don't have education. So I can't get a better job, which means I'm stuck in this low-paying job, and that cycle of poverty would continue. And so these kids even having to work, like I said, ages 6 to 10, working these adult kinds of shifts, were often working under very unhealthy and very dangerous conditions in these factories. And as a result, a lot of kids become very ill or even crippled or die at a very young age. And with these low wages that the working class families are getting paid, oftentimes they have to live in sort of like the, the lowest rent possible uh, living, uh, living facilities. They would live in these crowded, cold, poorly constructed tenement apartment buildings that were often built near the factories. What factory owners would do sometimes is they would actually build housing near the factory so that the workers could live in the housing and then get to the factory faster because, again, that's more efficient and more cost effective for the factory owner. Of course, on, a, on another part of this, the factory owner owns the apartments, and so the factory owner pays the workers for working, and then the workers turn around and pay the owner again to live in the apartments that he built for them. It's kind of a scheme if you think of it. I mean, smart business, I suppose. <laughs> Probably not moral uh, or, or anything like that. But in these, uh, in these factory cities, that's what you would get, basically, is a city that would grow up around the factory. In these factory cities, you could have whole families that live in, a, in an apartment that is just one or two rooms. Or in some cases, families that were very poor, you might have two families living in one apartment that is made up of only two rooms. And, you know, overcrowding was a real problem. And a lot of these apartments are, are very shoddy, and they're built mainly of wood. Wood, which means that fire is a major, major hazard. A lot of these factory cities, many of them have at some point in their history some major fire because you've got all these shoddy constructed tenement apartment buildings. On top of that, unsanitary conditions in these factory cities are everywhere. Sewers are almost non-existent, and if they are, they're not very good. So you get human waste in the streets sometimes. Industrial waste pollutes the streets and the environment around, especially when you get these factories with the big smokestacks that are spewing uh, the coal exhaust. You'll have coal dust literally on the streets as though it were a light snow. Really disgusting conditions to have to live in contaminated water supplies. Diseases like cholera and, and typhoid could become very, very common and often spread throughout the factories in the cities. Again, factory work can be very, very dangerous to your health and your life. And so what we're seeing is that for the working class, industrialization is really making their lives rather miserable. Life for the working class is very miserable and in many cases relatively short. Now, obviously, workers want to improve their conditions, okay? No one wants to sit and live like this. They want to make things better. But as individuals, they don't have the power to successfully stand against the factory owners. And so in order to be heard by the owners and to work for safer conditions, for better hours, for better pay, workers in a lot of factories slowly over time began to form labor unions where they would come together as one person you're weak and your voice can't be heard, but when you come together as a group, uh, you have a lot more power. And so to make their voices heard by the owners and to have their demands met, unions would go on strike or, or stop working. Uh, eventually, and this takes place over a number of years, but eventually through government legislation, unions are able to engage in what we call collective bargaining, where representatives of the workers, the union leaders, get to sit down and negotiate with owners to try to discuss their problems and to try to reach agreements on what's best for both parties. And so in this way, we start to see factory working conditions uh, improve, we see pay and hours improve, and generally life for the working class improve as a result. Well, that's a good stopping point for today, guys. I think we got to look at life for both the middle class and the working class. We saw, generally speaking, that industrialization was very good to the middle class. They increased in wealth, they increased in size, and they got to live pretty comfortable lives. Not so the same for the working class. Industrialization led to very difficult factory work that could be very dangerous, poor living conditions, low wages. But with the advent of unions uh, and collective bargaining, we see those conditions and pay and working hours uh, and lives improve as a result. So guys, those are the essential questions. That's what we covered today, and that's what you need to be ready to discuss the next time that we meet. But as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.